This episode is made possible by the realistic online game War Thunder. Check out this game through the link in the description below. Go through our link and not only do you support this show, but you get a free premium tank or aircraft or ship and three days of premium time as a bonus. And let's get into it. Picture the scene. It's January the 24th, 41 AD, and Rome is in chaos. The tyrant emperor Caligula has just been stabbed to death outside the Palatine Games. In the city, his wife has been murdered and his baby daughter has had her head dashed open against a wall. In this tense, bloody atmosphere, no one knows what will happen next. Will the Republic be restored or will a new emperor be found who will take the throne? At the height of this uncertainty, a soldier in the Praetorian Guard sweeps a Side a palace curtain and finds Caligula's useless uncle cowering in fright. But the guard doesn't kill the old man, instead, they proclaim the uncle Emperor Claudius. Born into the imperial household in the days of Augustus, Claudius was a sick, feeble child, never destined to amount to much. Yet, through a quirk of fate, he became the only candidate able to take the throne following Caligula's murder. Hounded by assassination attempts, surrounded by people conspiring against him, Claudius nonetheless became one of the greatest rulers in Roman history. Join us today as we plunge into the unlikely story of Rome's accidental emperor. On August the 1st, 10 BC, the Roman town of Lugdunum, now Lyon in France, prepared to welcome the latest member of the imperial household into the world. From the moment of his birth, Claudius, or to give him his full name, Tiberius Claudius Nero Germanicus, was one of the best connected people in the whole of Rome. His father was the powerful general Nero Claudius Drusus, while his mother was Antonia the Younger. If that doesn't sound so impressive, wait until you hear the next part. His grandmother on his father's side was the wife of the current emperor, Augustus. Also on his mother's side, he was descended from Mark Antony. Not only that, but his uncle was the future emperor Tiberius, his older brother was Germanicus, the future father of Caligula. Claudius wasn't just born with a silver spoon in his mouth, he was born practically suckling a whole cutlery set. Unfortunately, he was also born with a mysterious disability. We say unfortunately because ancient Rome was not somewhere that viewed the disabled kindly. The Roman ideal was to be a strong male who excelled at both athletic feats and oratory. Being able to do only one of those things was acceptable, but neither? Well, boy, you are going to be in for a bad time. And a bad time is exactly what young Claudius had. He limped, he stammered, his head twitched oddly, and he was known to dribble. For a family that prided itself on being the most perfectly Roman of all Romans, this was beyond embarrassing. Claudius's mother called him a monster of a man not finished but merely begun by Dame Nature. His grandmother refused to speak with him. It's said that when poor Claudius came to dinner, the rest of the family would throw food at him and jeer, mocking him for his disability. If that sounds horrific, just know that Claudius was actually one of the lucky ones. In those days, it was not uncommon for Romans to simply kill disabled children. The only reason the imperial family didn't do so is because that would have been an even bigger embarrassment. But while Claudius was disabled, he was by no means the idiot that his parents thought he was. The boy was insightful, intelligent, a born academic. At first, no one really noticed. After Claudius' father died in 9 BC, he was dumped with a tutor who tried to beat his disability out of him. But eventually, Augustus noticed Claudius' love of reading and in 7 AD tried to hire the historian Livy as his new tutor. This was an excellent move. Livy didn't try to beat Claudius until his disability went away. He gave him stacks of books to read, encouraged him to write, even helped him prepare and deliver speeches. As young Claudius started to come out of his shell, he began earning begrudging respect from his relatives. No mean feat when you remember that all of those relatives were total assholes. Yet even now, the imperial family kept Claudius from holding any public office. In private, they all agreed he should never, ever be allowed to become emperor. You can always imagine the fates looking down on these pompous mortals and just struggling not to laugh. The tortured chain of events that would eventually lead to Claudius becoming emperor began on the 19th of August 14 AD. 
That day, Augustus passed away after four decades on the throne. In the wake of the first citizen's death, Claudius' uncle Tiberius became emperor. Now, Tiberius was a weird choice. He was about as popular as a rectally inserted cactus, and he had only been adopted by Augustus because he had no other heirs. Perhaps realizing that Emperor Buck Cactus would be a disaster, Augustus had tried to mitigate things by making Tiberius in turn adopt Claudius' dashing older brother Germanicus. That way, no matter how painful Tiberius was for Rome's metaphorical backside, the soothing hemorrhoid cream of Germanicus would never be far behind. Unfortunately, Tiberius was a guy who believed in all pain and no gain. In 19 AD, Tiberius had Germanicus assassinated. In the aftermath, he had all of Germanicus's relatives either killed or imprisoned. We say all, but there were two conspicuous relatives this sentient, spiky suppository forgot all about. The first was Claudius, who Tiberius considered too weak and useless to even bother killing. The second was Germanicus's son, a preteen boy who went by the nickname Caligula. That was basically how the rest of Tiberius's reign went. Through the 20s AD, the emperor conducted purge after purge. Each time, he spared both useless Claudius and helpless Caligula. That's not to say Tiberius liked his stammering nephew. He kept Claudius alive because he didn't see him as a threat, but he also made sure to keep him miserable. When the Senate tried to let the poor guy join, Tiberius personally vetoed it for the good of the empire. On the other hand, the emperor also made a choice that was very much not good for the empire. In 32 AD, Tiberius was reaching the end of his life, and he needed an heir. His son Drusus had died the decade before, and he needed someone to fill the little boy's boots. He chose Caligula. Technically, this made Caligula his co-heir alongside Caligula's cousin, but you don't need to bother learning heir number two's name because Caligula quickly made sure there was no second heir to worry about. That taken care of, he then smothered Tiberius with a pillow in 37 AD, at least according to tradition, and had himself declared sole emperor. Since you've doubtless already seen our Caligula video, and if not, do we have a glorious Roman clickall lined up for you, then you already know that Caligula's reign was extremely not fun for everyone in Rome. But not for Claudius. Almost as soon as Caligula took the throne, he had his uncle elevated to consul, the first position of power the now 47-year-old had ever held. To this day, nobody really knows why Caligula showed Claudius such favor. Theories range from that he wanted to keep his potential enemies close, to just, well dude, it's Caligula, he's totally cuckoo. Yet even now, a dark cloud was forming that threatened to block Claudius's unexpected ray of sunshine. In December that year, Caligula's sister, Agrippina the Younger, gave birth to a son. She called him Lucius Demititus Ahenobarbus, but you know him by a different name, and that's Nero. While Caligula had taken a shine to Claudius, that didn't mean the older man was safe from his nephew's whims. By all accounts, Caligula treated Claudius more like a court jester than a relative, pushing him in the river for fun and forcing the poor guy to rack up huge debts funding Caligula's lifestyle. Still, considering what happened to most people in Caligula's orbit, Claudius got off relatively lightly. This was the emperor who forced parents to watch their children being tortured to death. The emperor who banished his own sister, Claudius' niece, Agrippina the Younger, to a remote island where she had to catch sponges for a living. And by the way, Agrippina the Younger, remember that name. Anyway, Claudius's life under Caligula continued to be a weird mix of awful and kind of okay. In 38 AD, he married Valeria Messalina, an influential member of the court, and in 39 AD, the couple had a daughter, Claudia Octavia. Yet this wasn't exactly true love. Messalina married Claudius because he was her ticket into the imperial household. The moment they had tied the knot, she began systematically committing adultery with everything with a pulse. The fact that he was being cuckolded on an almost hourly basis only added to Rome's general impression that Claudius was comically useless. But it was this comical uselessness that made Caligula treat his uncle more like a pet than a rival. And it wouldn't be long before the poor abused dog bit back at its master. By 41 AD, the knives were out for the mad emperor, in this case, literally. On January the 24th, Caligula was stabbed to death outside the Palatine Games. In the city, his wife and daughter were assassinated in their home. But the conspirators had been so focused on killing Caligula that they hadn't planned for what came next. 
The result was that Rome slid into near anarchy that day. In the Senate, emergency debates were even held on restoring the Republic. For the Praetorian Guard, this was worrying. The private guard of the Imperial household, they effectively got all their power from the system of emperors, revert back to a Republic, and they were done for. What they needed was a new emperor, someone who could take Caligula's place on the throne, ideally a relative, ideally someone weak, someone who could be manipulated. They found their candidate in the most unlikely place. At the moment the bloodshed erupted, Claudius had been in the imperial palace. Fearing he might be next, it hidden behind a curtain, and there he was still cowering when a Praetorian guardsman yanked it back, looking for all the world like he was going to stab the old man. But there was no bloodshed that day, no murder of Caligula's uncle. Instead, Claudius watched in dumbfounded silence as the Praetorian guard knelt and hailed him as their new emperor. Now, powerful as they were, the Praetorian Guard couldn't just unilaterally declare Claudius emperor. If the Senate had really wanted to restore the Republic, there would have been very little all these guys, now kneeling around a curtain, could have done about it. But the Senate was too divided. So when the Praetorian Guard presented their candidates, there was no united force to stop them. The day they declared Claudius emperor, you could almost hear the city groan, really? This idiot? But Claudius wasn't an idiot. These grumbling Romans didn't know it yet, but doddering Claudius was going to become the greatest emperor since Augustus. And just before we get into how that happens, let me take a moment to tell you about today's sponsor, War Thunder, who make videos like this one possible. War Thunder is a realistic free-to-play military vehicle combat game. It's available on PC, PS4, and Xbox One. There's also no need to purchase. This game is entirely free. You just download it and you play. In this game, there are over 1,200 historically accurate vehicles from all the way back in 1920 up until the 1990s. They're all very carefully built, incredibly detailed, and when you're playing the game, you can see that the physics has really been sweated over to make it just right. It's a really, really good game, and the sound also pretty amazing. And look, you can just jump in for a quick arcade game, which is useful if you don't have much time, or you can play realistic and go for the more challenging stuff, or if you're hardcore, there's always Simulator, but I don't play that, because I don't like getting my ass kicked over and over again. So, join us on the battlefield for free using the link below. Doing that not only supports this show, but you also get a free premium tank or aircraft or ship, and three days of premium time as a bonus just for registering. And let's get back to the video. If you would have been a Roman citizen in the early days of Claudius' rule, you probably would have felt like things were off to a bad start. One of Claudius' first acts was to bung the military with a hefty bribe to stop them rebelling against him. But that still wasn't enough, because in 42 AD, the governor of Dalmatia decided to go into rebellion regardless. This was pretty embarrassing for Claudius, especially as some senators sided with the rebel governor, but it wasn't fatal for him. At the last moment, the governor's troops rebelled against him, and the would-be revolutionary was forced to commit suicide. Still, it's not like Claudius could crack down on the dissenters or anything like that. In this period, the Senate was calling the shots. They declared that Caligula's statues should be torn down, and they mostly were. They blocked Claudius's attempts to bring Caligula's assassins to justice, allowing only the head conspirator to be executed. And by the way, if you're wondering why Claudius went after the guys who did him a favor by icing Caligula, it was mostly about precedence. Everyone had benefited from Caligula dying, but you couldn't have people thinking that assassination was a legitimate legit way to remove an emperor. I mean, this was ancient Rome, it wasn't ancient Ro Oh, wait, never mind. <laughs> The other big mistake Claudius made in his early reign was, oddly, to show mercy. Remember Agrippina the Younger, Caligula's sister, Claudius' niece, and Nero's mother who got exiled to their remote random island? Well, Claudius brought her back to Rome. He pardoned her, and he set her up with a new husband to look after both her and Nero. In the long run, this would prove to be a fatal move. By the end of 42 AD, Claudius was so insecure in his position that it was entirely possible there would be yet another new emperor within the year. What Claudius needed was a major victory, a military conquest that would show the world he was more than just a doddering old man. Luckily, 
he had just the place in mind. Nearly a century ago, the great Julius Caesar had failed to conquer a rain-soaked island north of Gaul. That island's name was Britannia, and Claudius was going to bring it into the Roman Empire. There's a lot we don't know about Claudius's conquest of Britannia in 43 AD. Our only real source is Cassius Dio, who was born over a hundred years after the invasion. But we do know that there were two major battles with the Britons, finally leading to the establishment of a crossing point on the Thames. We also do know that Claudius personally went to Britannia just in time to lead his troops to victory, a move that won him major plaudits back in Rome. We know, too, that he wasn't the only emperor involved in the war. The future emperor, Vespasian, was among the commanders in Claudius' army. On his own initiative, he conquered the southwest of Britain all the way to modern-day Exeter. By the end of 43 AD, Claudius had done what even Julius Caesar couldn't. It pacified the south of this rainy island. While there would be troubles with the Britons in the future, Boudicca launched her famous revolts in 60 AD, for now, Claudius was riding high. Back in Rome, Claudius was awarded a triumph. For the first time, the average Roman in the street was looking askance at the emperor and saying, Well, this dude's not so bad. Well, buckle up, ancient Romans, because for a while at least, things are going to keep getting better. Today, Claudius' reign is best remembered for territorial expansion and for the fact that he wasn't either Caligula or Nero. But there were domestic triumphs too, and they went beyond merely building aqueducts. Claudius was the first emperor since Augustus to really shake up the bureaucracy. While Tiberius had contented himself with the odd purge and Caligula had just done whatever wacky stuff popped into his mind, Claudius tried to seriously reform the empire. One of his key achievements was to introduce Gauls into the Senate. Gaul had been under Roman rule for for the best part of a century, but the Senate was still reserved for those born on the Italian peninsula. This was all fine and dandy when you were a small, conquering force of Italian groups, but when you were a vast, multinational empire, it was less than ideal. Claudius was the one who broke the taboo of letting non-Italians into the lawmaking process. Although it caused a massive fight at the time, it likely saved the empire in the long run. Claudius also championed the rights of slaves and ex-slaves, bringing in a law that made it illegal to kill your slave for no reason. To Years, that might sound like one of those things that should really go without saying, but before Claudius, there had been nothing to stop a Roman citizen coming home from a bad day at the Forum and stabbing their slave to death. In tandem with this decree, Claudius began promoting freedmen inside his own court. He made ex-slaves, head of his correspondence, head of the palace treasury, and placed them in other positions too numerous to count. For the Senate, this was just another outrage. These guys were former slaves, they were the lowest of the low, and here they were, among the emperor's closest advisers. Perhaps it's no surprise malicious rumors began to spread that the freedmen were really the ones who were controlling Claudius and not the other way around. Not that Claudius was a perfect ruler, I mean, even if you agree with all of the stuff that he was doing. He was prone to issuing odd decrees, such as the ruling he passed that farting in public was good for you. So yes, I suppose Emperor Claudius was technically history's first proponent of better out than in. Overall, though, you'd be hard-pressed as an ancient Roman to say that Claudius was doing a bad job. Oh, sure, the Senate stank of imperial bug-ass half the time, but stuff was otherwise measurably better. Finances were again on a sound footing after Caligula's excess, the judiciary was functioning well, with Claudius even personally hearing cases and granting clemency where the law demanded unduly harsh punishments. Yet despite all these undoubted improvements, the Roman elites could just not get over the fact that Claudius was, well, Claudius. He still limped. He still stammered. His wife still cheated on him. And for the toxically macho Romans, it was all simply too much. In his years in charge, Claudius was forced to put over 300 people to death for plotting against him. Pretty much every week brought some new assassination plot or planned rebellion. Yet Claudius dodged them all, wandering obliviously through the drawn daggers like Buster Keaton in a hurricane. But while Claudius was becoming an expert at avoiding assassination attempts, there was one that he wouldn't see coming until it was far too late. In 47 AD, Agrippina the Younger's wealthy husband dropped dead in mysterious circumstances, leaving the emperor's niece in need of a new man. This was fortunate timing, because the emperor was about to be in the market for a new wife. Okay, so remember Claudius's wife, Messalina, the one who kept cheating on him? Well, she was still cheating on him, like she was trying to break some sort of record, which 
She possibly was. It said Messalina and a famous Roman prostitute had a competition to see who could sleep with the most men in a single day, and Messalina won. But Messalina's plans went further than just getting her kicks behind Claudius's back. Like everyone else, she was still convinced that the emperor was an idiot, to the extent that she actually married another man in a lavish ceremony in the heart of Rome. The plan was that she would kill Claudius and her new husband would assume the throne. Instead, word of this incredibly not secret secret marriage got back to the emperor who was like all, uh, guys, what? And then he had Messalina killed. And so it was that Claudius became single again, just as Agrippina was looking for a new squeeze. Now, if you've already seen our Nero video, and yes, we did do the emperors very out of order, you'll already know that Agrippina was a woman desperate to secure herself against future poverty. However, the way she went about all of this was sort of a bit... Ew. Throughout 48 AD, Agrippina set her sights on seducing her uncle Claudius. Of course, it takes two to tango, and Claudius was just as creepily open to the suggestion as Agrippina was. When they got married on New Year's Day 49 AD, the official reason was to unite the two branches of the imperial family. But Roman society at large was pretty sure it was just a convenient excuse for Claudius to live out his weird incest fantasies. But not everyone saw the marriage as a PR disaster. For the past decade, young Nero had been living with his mother, the two quietly biding their time. In 50 AD, Agrippina convinced Claudius to officially adopt Nero as his son. Now, Nero was technically co-heir alongside Claudius's previous son, Britannicus, but that hadn't stopped Caligula from seizing power alone, and it wouldn't stop Nero either. The last act came in 53 AD, when Agrippina made Nero marry Claudius's daughter, Claudia Octavia. From having nothing just a few years beforehand, Agrippina and Nero had maneuvered their way into the heart of power. She was the emperor's wife, he was the emperor's adopted son and heir, and married to the emperor's daughter. It should have been blindingly obvious to anyone watching that Agrippina and the teenage Nero were preparing for a hostile takeover. But as he had been with Messalina, Claudius was blind to the flaws of his new wife. Oblivious to the danger he was in, it's likely he never even realized what was happening. Agrippina and Nero they made their move on October 13th, 54 AD. That day, Claudius abruptly died from a sudden sickness. While it's not certain what happens, tradition holds that Agrippina bribed a court taster to slip Claudius poisoned mushrooms. Whatever the truth, when the emperor was dead, Agrippina led Nero to the Praetorian Guard and had him declared sole ruler of Rome. And that was that. The reign of Claudius it was over, and the time of Nero was here. And what a time it would be. As he grew older, Nero would get crazier and crazier until he finally... Well, let's just say you should watch our video on Nero for the rest of that story. As for Claudius, he was deified after his death, worshipped as a god by his former subjects. Compared to the fates of Tiberius, Caligula, and Nero, this was a bit of a win. Even Nero revoking Claudius' deification in the 60s AD didn't dent the accidental emperor's popularity. A few years later, Vespasian would restore Claudius to his place in the Pantheon. At the end of all of that excitement, then, what should we make of Claudius? Well, from one angle, he was still a bit of a disaster. Don't forget, without Claudius marrying Agrippina, you don't get Nero, who was arguably the worst emperor of all. But to look at him from another angle, it's a story of inspiration. Here was a man born with a disability into a society that routinely killed its disabled members, only for him to rise to the very top. Once he reached the top, he ruled with a sense of moderation and sanity not seen since the days of Augustus. He made life in the empire fairer. He saw his subjects not just as toys he could break on a whim, but as actual people. In the end, Claudius may not have been a truly great emperor like, say, Trajan, but he was a good man. He was decent. He was kind. He wasn't cruel. He was everything his successor would fail to be. Perhaps that fact alone is enough to justify his place in history. So I really hope you did enjoy that video. Please do hit that thumbs up button below. Also, if you want to support this show, do that by supporting our fantastic sponsor, War Thunder, link below. And as always, I'll see you next time.